Hi my friends, it's Ro. Welcome back to my channel. Today we have a guest on, her name is Nico, and her husband is in a Missouri facility. So we all know about the conditions in Missouri prisons. I have a video, I think it was filmed around Christmas time, where there were just major riots that broke out inside of Missouri prisons. There were death after death after death because of the conditions in there. The water was coming out of the faucets brown. They were living in condemned buildings. There was standing water that was dirty all the time. It was a dump. Inmates were treated horrifically. Nothing has changed, although there were steps celebrities were getting on board, all of a sudden we were hit with this crazy worldwide problem that we're all going through and experiencing right now. So of course that stopped and everybody's attention went to this. Well, the conditions did not get any better and instead now these people are stuck in there in these conditions without soap, without hand sanitizer, living all on top of each other in standing water, no way to keep themselves distant or clean or escaping germs. And basically they are living in a breeding ground for this to spread and become extremely catastrophic. If you're interested in hearing Nico's story, please keep watching. If you're new here, my name is Ro. I'm the founder of an organization called Strong Prison Wives and Families, the author of a book called The Comeback Code. I'll pop a link to it right up there. We don't glorify or glamorize prison or prison wife life here. Frankly, the whole entire thing sucks, especially right now. It is so anxiety ridden and hard. It's just hard, harder than usual. But if you stick with me, I will keep you educated and I will share exercises and tools that I've used throughout the decades my loved one has been incarcerated to help get you through this really painful journey. Do me a favor and hit the thumbs up button. That'll just help me out on YouTube. We need to spread the word about this right now to help our loved ones stay safe and potentially come home. And no matter if it was two years or five years or 20 years, they could be serving a death sentence at this point because of this awful bug. Now it's spreading more and more and more in prisons. It's just gonna take too many lives, thousands of lives. And one life lost is too many lives. Anyway, whew. so by hitting thumbs up, it'll just help YouTube share out this video. Please also subscribe and ring the notification bell to stay on top of all the updates that I post and to be notified when I post a video. We usually post every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I do go live here and there in between. So I was on Facebook the other day and my friend Nico had posted something and she was so passionate her passion jumped off the screen at me. She was infuriated. She had done an interview with the news and they kind of twisted her words and they eliminated things that she said and they pigeonholed her. She really wasn't happy with the way that it was edited and that it was portrayed on TV. I'm so inspired by and so drawn to people who have passion behind what they're doing. People who are soldiers and fighters and not victims. And that's what screamed at me. So I reached out to her and I said, I'd love to have you on the channel. So when we spoke on the phone, we were talking about the media and I said, I've done a lot of media myself where they take our words and they twist them because they want us to fit into this little pigeonhole of prison wife and what that stigma should be. So instead of coming across sounding educated and sounding like she was fighting for the whole entire state, they made her sound like an insecure prison wife who just needed her husband home because she was codependent and she couldn't live without him and everything else. So I told her, you can use my platform to tell your story. However you wanna tell it, share the details, share the fact there's not even soap. Share the fact that the warden's saying, oh, we have hand sanitizer, and when you pressed him further, it's on his desk locked in his office. I know that all of us are going through this right now. I know that anybody has who has a loved one who's incarcerated is going through this right now. Nico's story is one of hundreds of thousands, and I'm trying to show the reality of what we on the outside face, and I'm trying to pass along ideas and things for you to do Use Nico's story as a lesson in what you can do to fight for your loved one moving forward. We have to make noise. The only way that we can get them to listen to us and to help us is if we stand together and we make noise. Without wasting any more time, here's Nico and her story. Hi, my name is Nikolai. I was asked by Ro to come on and speak with my situation going on with my husband with the 
going around, also known as the my husband's name is Zachary, and he's currently in the Missouri Department of Corrections on a 12-year sentence, and he has completed his 40%. Um, he completed that back in December of 2019, and he also had his parole hearing in December as well, and we received a February 2022 release date. Since then, he was sent to drug treatment in Fordland, Missouri at the Ozark Correctional Center. He's been there for about a month and a half. Everybody knows how dirty and filthy the conditions are in prisons. They're nasty. They're not up to health code. People that come in there to do checks they just, you know, mark it off. They don't write anything up. And I mean, I don't know how it is in other states, but when you see cockroaches and mice in the visiting room, you can only imagine what the, the housing units look like. Anyway, my husband tells me all the time what they are, so I know what, what they look like. They're disgusting. And to get a phone call from your husband saying, you know, when there's this crazy pandemic going on and people are freaking out out here, that he was just told that there's no soap that they just announced while you're on the phone that there's no soap and before the announcement there was soap but the soap was very watered down it was cut with water and it's supposed to be cut with water it has a ratio but they cut it so much that it's literally like the it's you know just like water slipping through your fingers and when you go to use it it doesn't do anything the cleaner that they use is this I haven't personally looked it up but I've heard my husband's told me that it's not even an antibacterial cleaner it's called 710 it does nothing again there's no hand sanitizer at all and the governor has issued like a whole bunch of like two or three different temporary orders for bans to be lifted on things that would usually be considered contraband and sanitizer and certain you know cleaning chemicals obviously are considered contraband normally because of the alcohol content in them He's ordered for that to be lifted temporarily so that the, the inmates can have a proper defense to to defend you know, themselves from this, this, this nasty virus. I have spent countless hours and days every day since this has happened, since this started happening even before the soap issue. Um, I was told about, I was, you know, calling people to see about what were we going to do, how we were going to help them because, you know, we already knew they don't have the means or the supplies or even the employees for that matter to have these things implemented. I spoke with the warden, for example, of the facility that he's at, Warden Brian O'Connell, and I spoke with him for an hour. I have all my phone calls recorded with everybody I talk to. I have called the governor, I've called central office in Jefferson City, and spoke with several different people. And these are people that I've spoke with for a very long time just because, I mean, like that I've, I have, I've spoke with before this because of how much time my husband's done. So I'm familiar with who these people and what really honestly is going to happen from these phone calls, which is nothing. And that's what's brought me to where we're at today. And I'm reaching out to Roe and I started a petition, but I think about a week ago, I've been in contact with a lawyer and I'm going to talk to a couple more to get a better idea of what I'm doing or what I can do. I also did a news interview a few days ago and it was horrible. That's a whole other story. And I've, I'll send the clip to Ro and if she wants to put it in there, it's totally fine. My message and that was not conveyed how I wanted it to be. It was supposed to be DOC as a whole because not only are our loved ones at risk that are serving time, but it is the employees, all the employees from the guards to the, the secretary at the front desk answering phones and to COs and the nursing staff, especially the nursing staff, everybody is at risk. And then you have volunteers. I live in Missouri, obviously. There's a church not too far that was also going to where my husband's at, at his facility. Volunteers were going into my husband's facility still after there were confirmed cases of COVID at their church. They were still being allowed to go there. They were being asked to come forward by the mayor to get tested if they had attended these services that this person was at. And, and yet they were still allowing them to come into the prison and do these groups and things. 
And when I was asked, why are these men still in in groups and classes of 40, 50 people shoulder to shoulder, you know, and, and, and inmates are coughing all over each other and you, you're not going to give them a Kleenex to, to cover their mouth, you know, and nothing. They told me that because of the kind of community that this is, the uh, kind of population that they are, it can't work. It just wouldn't work because they need routine and they need this and that. And I, my response was, they're not preschoolers. You know, out here, hello, we have everything is canceled, church, every activity you could possibly think of, school, and we're doing fine. I was just, I was very taken back, I guess, by their response, both from the warden and the, I think it's the communications director up at central office in Jefferson City that said that they would go crazy because of the population, uh, the type of population, basically stereotyping that that just wouldn't work. Then she also said, she also said, ma'am, a whole bunch of other wives and families would be very upset if we had to keep your husband longer than we were supposed to have and he'd be home late due to having to cut the class sizes because of And I said, um, I mean, I get where you're trying to go with this, but I would be even more angry if my husband got sick due to not practicing any type of social distancing and doing what you can with what type of environment that you have and him getting sick at all or get sick and the worst happen, he, you know, not ever come home you have this and that's thrown at you this life-threatening thing that gets more serious by the day by the hour some days it seems like or it is and you know that your husband is in conditions that are a breeding ground for this thing also his immune system is compromised he has medical conditions i'm doing everything that i can to make sure something can change in the Missouri Department of Corrections, that I can be not just heard, but also listened to because these are real life things. And people from the administration office, the warden even, they sit up in their office, we all know that, you know, and then and they try and tell us, oh, but there's policy for this, there's a procedure for this, this is in our handbook. Okay, I know, I write your handbook. But just because it's in your handbook and you say that it's a procedure or policy doesn't mean that the COs or your employees or caseworkers are implementing it and it's being played out. It's not being enforced. And just like out here, the stay-at-home orders that are in place that, uh, you know, in some areas, there's lots of people who aren't listening to it because it's not a law, you know, or not, not even because it's not a law. It's not being enforced. Nothing's happening, you know, to these people that aren't following it. And they just happen to not be getting sick. And when somebody close to them or themselves gets sick, then yeah, they are forced to stay at home or whatever. But does it have to come to that for inmates and for employees and for volunteers? The volunteers need to be cut off. The employees, the staff need to have proper PPE as well. And the inmates, uh, Governor Parson, I don't necessarily care for him, but in the beginning he did say that those bans should be temporarily lifted and have a sanitizer and cleaning supplies readily available to both a vendor and staff member. And it is not. And the warden himself, Mr. O'Connell, Brian O'Connell, when I said, you know, where is this hand sanitizer? Because he said, oh, we do have some. And I said, okay, so it's available? And he said, yeah, it's at the front office where you, the employees and everybody checks in at. And it's here and here and here. And I said, okay, so are you telling me that the offenders have access to that as well? And he said, well, I mean, I have some here on my desk. I have a bottle sitting here right in front of me. And I said, oh, I'm sure you do. I was like, so do you go down in the housing units and put a squirt in every, every offender and staff member's hand personally? And he was like, well, no, of course, because there wouldn't be any, you know, left for you. And I said, but, you know, these things that I understand are, are considered contraband. Why? You've been asked to put a temporary lift on them to protect these people, to give them some sort of defense. And I'm not saying that there's not going to be a drastic outbreak in the prisons anyway because of the conditions. But the things that they are able to do 
they're not doing. And that's the point, that there is serious, serious medical neglect on their part. And there um, has been one confirmed case of an inmate in the Depart Department of Corrections. They're at a facility in St. Joe, Missouri by Kansas City, and they are in the hospital. And then there's also an employee of the Department of, Cor of Corrections and that I, I think that it might be um, from probation and parole, a confirmed case. And it is only going to be a matter of time before this spreads like wildfire and everybody knows it. And I have been told by somebody who is very close with a lot of people higher up. He's actually an ex-offender. He's served a lot of time in prison. And he's on now kind of the other side of things where he helps guys that are just getting out. But he also, you know, he works for Department of Mental Health. So he has some contacts that he's communicated with. And not only did Governor Parson say that no, absolutely not at this time, were we, are we thinking about releasing any inmates from state facilities, but my friend also knows and has said it's not going to happen or be even being considered until things get really, really bad, extremely bad. And I, I'm scared. I'm scared for my husband. If I can't get him out, the, you know, I don't think that I'm asking too much for him to at least be able to protect his health and for every other inmate and employee have the ability, the access, the things that they need to protect themselves as well. And with that being said, I have a petition going. I have a little over 200 signatures, I believe, so far. It basically says everything that I've told you guys now, and it's asking for a mass release of XYZ type offenders. Hep C is covered, nonviolent offenders covered, people with two years or less, people that are in treatment, people that have compromised immune systems, people that are, um, I think, 65 and above. I tried to cover as most as I could. I've been asked, what do you want in the least amount to come out of this? And I was like, I would, I mean, I would like to see at least these people be allowed the right to wash their hands with real soap. And these people be allowed to have Kleenexes and proper cleaning supplies because they do live in an environment that is breeding grounds. And they do live in an environment where they're forced to live in very close quarters, you know, and I would like to see there be proper medical care or proper steps for when these people do start getting sick and they're not ignored because my husband has already been sick. Thank God it wasn't, you know, maybe it wasn't COVID. Maybe it was. We don't know. He had a fever. He had chills. He had night sweats. He woke up several times, multiple times. It soaked in sweat. His throat hurt. He had a horrible cough. All these things. It was hard for him to breathe. And his temperature was taken and he was given ibuprofen and sent back to general population. You're fine. So in the very least, I would like to see change. But I feel like you and I both know you know, even if you've been doing this a very short time, even if you've been doing this five minutes, you know that there is very little medical care and policies, procedures, guidelines, a handbook that is ever really followed through on. It's hardly ever enforced and carried out. Yes, I would like to see that change and I would, I would love to see a mass release, even if it didn't include my husband. He has served 15 years and he's serving 40% of that. He's already served 40%. My husband is totally different than he used to be. And I don't want to sound like one of those people that has to sell him to somebody, but I know. And when you know, you know. And you all who are watching understand that. I did know him before. We were good friends before. We've had a great relationship. Um, there have been ups and downs, of course. And it's been really hard, especially when we were first together and he was a kid and I was a kid. And I walked away once due to that. My husband deserves a chance to defend himself against COVID. He deserves a chance to come home. He deserves a chance to live whatever life God allows him to have with his family. Um, however long God sees fit for him and he deserves to be with his family 
and know that they're okay and his family know that he's okay. So at the end of the day, my main goal is I want my husband to come home. I want him to come home alive and healthy. And I am doing everything in my power to see that that happens, whether it's by a mass release or me having to hire an attorney and seeing what they can do and fighting for him to be able to get out of there because of because I don't want my husband to get sick and potentially have this virus kill him. I did not sign up for 15 years to not bring my husband home. I feel like we paid our debt. I know that everybody's going through this. Being people that have this one big thing in common, letting somebody who is incarcerated, I know that all of you feel this situation and feel the co situation across the board and I am praying for each one of you in our community and I'm sending you love and nothing but good positive vibes and nothing but blessings and health for you and your loved one and everybody that surrounds you in your life. I would love for you guys to sign this petition. If you know of any good lawyers and if any advice at all, please let me know. I'll give Roe the number to Governor Parson and I'm going to continue to press him and put pressure on him to consider a release. I really, really appreciate Roe letting me come on here and share with you guys my story and what we're going through and hopefully maybe my situation can help one of you guys out there dealing with the same thing. I know that we are dealing with the same thing so we're in it together and I hope together we can make something happen. Thank you, Ro. Thank you, strong prison wives and families, for not only hearing me, but taking the last 26 minutes to really, really listen to my heart and my concerns, because it's only the vulnerable that get sick. While your only is my everything. Thank you. Much love to you all. I'll post Nico's petition in the description box below. If you know any way you could help, let me know. If you have an intriguing story about this inside of prisons, if you have footage from the inside, feel free to send it to me at strongprisonlives at gmail.com and I will feature you. I'll feature your loved one and I'll feature your story. I'm here to help you as much as I am to help myself with my loved one coming home. You guys keep staying strong, keep loving strong, keep supporting one another through this journey because you're one day closer to all being behind you. Lots of love from my heart to all of yours. I'll see you beautiful ladies and gentlemen in the next one. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and please stay home. Much love to you all.